Good afternoon. Welcome to the Chicago Money Show. We help you get informed, feel engaged, and have fun with your finances. I'm your host, Bridget Sullivan Marmel, and I own a family financial planning practice in Chicago. Today, we had financial expert Terry Savage scheduled to appear on our show, but unfortunately, she won't be able to join us. Uh, in preparation for Terry's appearance, we have people send in all their financial questions. And I am a financial planner and I answer these questions all the time. And so I am going to go ahead and field these questions. And I have a whole pile. Remember, this is a live show. So I can answer your questions as well as she can. And you can call the number on your screen and ask the question. Um, first, let's start out with this question that I got. And here's the question. My child is a freshman at an out-of-state college. I want him to graduate in four years for my own financial reasons. He suggests doing things like moving out of the dorm with the same roommate, and this is after a, a month in college, uh, which presumably is more expensive. I, should I encourage him to get a job, pay an incentive for grades? What do you think? Yeah. Uh, okay, so here is how I would approach this question. Uh, you know that you've got, conf you've got some parameters here which you didn't have before. And it seems like one parameter is that you uh, can only spend so much money on college and you know that you have enough money for four years, not five, six, seven, you know how people are at college. And, and so because of that, you want him to focus and graduate in four years. Sounds reasonable enough. Okay. Uh, and then you've got a young person and they are feeling all the overwhelm of uh, loving college and all the different possibilities of what they can do now. So they have all kinds of ideas in mind. And the realities of the situation might not really uh, be forefront for them. So then the other thing you've got for them it, with a uh, college person is uh, not necessarily a good ability to plan four years in advance. So, however, they do probably have decent enough math ability. So they can, if you get a spreadsheet out, you can put it together. So I encourage you to have a joint meeting with your son and say, okay, let us think this through. Here are your parameters. Let's put together a spreadsheet and we'll figure out uh, this is how much we can put in and this is how we're going to help you plan for the future. Now, as far as incentivizing for grades, you know your son. So you know if that would be a good way to incentivize him uh, so that he can do some of the other things. But you also know if maybe he would like a job, because sometimes getting a job when you're in college helps you focus your attention. So uh, you know your son, and helping him set goals, I think, is the biggest thing, and saying this is our family goal. Oh, we've got a caller. So uh, caller, why don't you go ahead with your question? First, if you can tell us your first name and the neighborhood you're calling from, that'd be great. Hi, uh, this is Mike from Irving Park. Hi, Mike. Why don't you go ahead with your question? Hi, I'm just wondering what your thoughts are on uh, kids with an allowances and, you know, should they work for it? And, you know, what, what do you think about allowances? I'm going to hang up and let you uh, 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 answer. Okay, Thank great. You. Thank you so much for your question. Okay, so with kids and allowances, I think uh, there's a few different things you need to keep in mind. When I was a kid, uh, we had a rule, and I was the fifth kid, so you know, as well established what the rules were. Uh, we had a rule that once you were six, you got a quarter a week, so this goes back a while, and you had to make your bed. So <laughs> I, after when you know, I was six years old and one week, and I promptly said I made my bed every day. I I would like my allowance. So uh, that was an interesting, and we never had to do anything more than make our better. So that was an interesting uh, thing. So I think that first you want to start with what happened to you and how did you feel? 
The other thing is similar to the previous question, you have to take into consideration the cognitive uh, development of your child. So with a six-year-old making your bed, here's your money, is uh, about right. With a 10-year-old, you might uh, have more chores for more money, but maybe a base plus more money for more chores might work. The other question I have is who initiates it? For us, we put the hand up. It was, it was on Saturday morning. That's when we got paid. And the kids initiated it. It wasn't my parents uh, saying, here's, your, here's yours. We had, to, we had to go ahead and ask, and then we uh, got the money. There was another interesting lesson that happened with shoveling. So one time my brother and I were shoveling, and my dad said, I'm not going to pay you, because uh, that was an extra chore that we got paid for, unless you have an invoice. And we were probably 10 and 12 at the time. I had no idea what an invoice was. So we got out the dictionary. We looked up what is an invoice. And we created an invoice and gave it to my dad. And uh, that was actually, it was a fun kind of learning experience. So that's another type of thing that you can uh, play around with is kind of using the opportunity to teach your kids more about money. Okay, so here's another question we got. Uh, I'm a 56-year-old woman, and I feel undervalued and underpaid at my job. I just won a metrics-based award for excellence based on how well I'm doing. Now I've got another job offer. They offered a 4% raise. I want more like 20%. Do you have any negotiating tips? Now, it seems like the time to get a raise is when you're switching jobs. And so, because you have the most leverage then, because you can leave, so, or not take the job. So it seems like with negotiating, it's all about how much you want something and what leverage do you have. I also think stating what you want and what you need so that if there's uh, other items that can make you happy that aren't about money, that can help. And thirdly, I would say, just as a general rule, one of my, I, when I had a regular job in corporate America, uh, consistently felt undervalued and underpaid. And looking back on it, I don't know if I was or not. I really don't. But I can tell you that for me, it was a sign that uh, it was a good idea to start my own business because then I didn't have to worry about somebody setting my pay. Um, I had a lot more control over it myself. So I had to uh, rethink that. Like, so I can say having my own business has helped solve that situation. All right, let's see, what else do we have? I am 89 and wondering if I should put my house in a trust for my beneficiary. Should it be irrevocable? Should it be revocable or irrevocable? And what would most benefit my heirs? Should I put the home in a trust, even if the decision is made to sell it in the near future? All right. So we have a few different questions here, really. Um, we have the, should I put the, uh, my house in a trust? And then what type of trust, revocable or irrevocable? And what would help my, your goal, which it's nice that the goal is stated here. I want the best benefit for my heirs. And should I do this even if I'm going to sell it? Um, okay, so my take on this is that I like to keep things simple. And I have found trusts tend to muck things up more than uh, keep them simple. And I feel my experience is they uh, don't work just as often as they do work. They don't do what they're, you're intending them to do is just as much as they do do what they intend them to do. Uh, there's some professionals out there that seem to make their living recommending them. And I always scratch my head wondering why. So in, in this situation, unless um, the house is worth millions, I would say you want to make sure you have a will that makes clear who, who your beneficiaries are. 
and make sure that that is in place. It's also a great idea once you're revisiting your will to also revisit the associated powers of attorney, your healthcare power of attorney and your durable power of attorney. That's outside the scope of this question, but just a, another tip. And um, I think keeping it simple would benefit your heirs the most. Should I put the home in trust even if the decision is made to sell in the near future? I, if you know that you're gonna sell your house, I would say don't bother with the trust. I mean, you're gonna have, if, if you have a trust, you're going to have to uh, change the deed, uh, you're gonna have to create the trust, and you're gonna have to change the title, the deed and the title to your house. So if you know you're gonna sell, I would say uh, hold off on that. And it should be easy to revisit your will if you've got one, or uh, update your will if, it, it, after you review it, update it um, to make sure that it's what you want, and then uh, make sure your heirs know about it. We have a phone call. Go ahead, caller, if you can tell us your first name and the neighborhood you're calling from. Hello, I'm Hello. And I'm calling from Canaryville, which is quite big point here in Chicago. Go ahead with your question. Um, I was just wondering, what are some safe investments for beginners? Ah, okay, great. So safe, so the caller says, what are safe investments for beginners? Okay. And, um, so I'm gonna uh, answer this question and kind of go on two tracks. So one track is, let's say you haven't really gotten your first job yet and you're, you, or you got a first part-time job and you're um, still like under, you're, you're 16 and you just want to invest. And, uh, or you just wanna like try to um, sort it out, play it out. And your, your goals are very, just to try to get your feet wet. Um, in that case, I would just recommend a um, index fund that is uh, like a large company index fund. Um, I'll mention Vanguard, uh, they're uh, ubiquitous, but there's also other uh, index funds as well. Now, you want to make sure that you also have an adequate emergency fund. And that uh, really helps you with being actually ultimately being able to save more. And I recommend 10% for that. Now, the other type of person is a person who's going to save money in their 401k or, you know, really this is for retirement. Um, my advice in that situation is they in uh, 401ks and 403bs and most retirement accounts, they have to, they give you choices. And one of the choices is generally a target date fund which is just a uh, fund that says, we're targeting your retirement at X date. So it'll be target 2050 or 2030 or 2045. Those are a decent way to start out if you just want to keep it simple and put it in your 401k. They're even better if it's target done fund by uh, Fidelity, or Fidelity or Vanguard or other ones that are uh, very low cost. Um, but that's a great way to just, again, get, get going. And then once you have built up to be like $100,000, which sounds like a lot when you're starting out, but it, ha it happens faster than you, you would think. Uh, once you get up to about $100,000, then you can start saying, okay, do I wanna get more sophisticated with this? Okay. All right, so the next question we got before was, what about annuities versus CDs versus I-bonds? Um, I know I've been talking about iBonds a lot lately. Um, when do you recommend annuities? When do you recommend CDs? And when do you recommend iBonds? It seems like a lot of advisors get paid for selling annuities. I um, uh, okay, so here's how, so we have iBonds, annuities, and, and CDs. Okay. And so let's talk about each one a little bit. Um, CDs, you can buy at a bank or you can buy through any of the major brokerage firms and they pay interest and they are guaranteed by the US government, which means they're safe. 
um, annuities are you pay, give the money, you give your money to an insurance company, and then they say they're going to invest it, it somehow, uh, and then they say we'll pay you money in a stream at some point in the future. And then the third thing is I bonds, which are uh, called inflation bond. They're, they're inflation bonds. They are savings bonds that you have to buy at U.S. Uh, Treasury Direct, and you can put up to ten thousand dollars a year in them. But they are geared to pay at the at least keep up with inflation. So actually, right now they're a great deal. Uh, they've got um, their interest rate is over three point five percent right now. Uh, so a lot of people like them. They're, you can only put in ten thousand dollars a year, and again, you need to buy them through U.S. Treasury Direct, and you've got to keep them in there for a year. Uh, and then after, if you take them out between one and five years, the interest rate's not quite as high, uh, but it's still a uh, a good deal. So between those three, the the other thing about both annuities and um, the I bonds is that you don't have to pay tax on the interest until you take the money out. So they're both tax deferred accounts, okay? And a CD, you can buy them in an IRA if you had an IRA, or you can buy, in, in which case the income would be tax deferred, or you can just buy them in a regular taxable account or a savings account, and then the, you'd pay uh, tax on it as you're going along. Um, so those are the different things. Again, just, uh, Annuities, there are advisors that make their money on annuities, and I feel like they overcomplicate them and they sell them to people. Uh, they're, they're good at selling them to people, and they don't necessarily focus on the fees. And if you were to go about uh, really trying to figure out what the fees are, then you've, you might be disappointed by how much they actually have to make. and. The other thing is that they are uh, guaranteed by the insurance company, which is not the U.S. government, and they have a guarantee in wherever state you're in. So Illinois has a state guarantee fund that guarantees up to $300,000, but it's not considered as safe as the U.S. either I-bonds or CDs, which are both backed by the uh, government. So these are all good ideas for people who want to make money in a safe way and uh, for people who are more on the edge of retirement. All right. All right. Here's another question I've got. I am 63 and thinking about long-term care insurance. My financial advisor isn't pushing it, but I'm thinking about it anyway. What are your thoughts? Okay. So long-term care insurance is, uh, care is insurance that you buy to help pay for medical expenses if you can't do some of the daily acts of uh, taking care of yourself. So it would help pay for nursing homes, for instance. It would help, and most of them now these days will help pay for in-home care as well. But it's really for uh, end-of-life issues. Now. Um, there's some people who are really concerned about uh, what if something happens to me when I'm in that age group and I don't have enough money. Um, well, if you don't have enough money at that point, then a Medicare, or excuse me, Medicaid kicks in. And so generally, I recommend if you have less than $250,000, uh, you stick with not buying long-term care insurance. If you have more than $1.5 million, you can probably self-insure or take care of it yourself. If you're really worried about it, then you might want to go ahead and buy some long-term care insurance. But the people in the sweet spot are between, have a net worth of between $250,000 and $1.5 million. Okay, so we've got another caller. So caller, if you can state your name and what neighborhood you're calling from, that'd be great. Hi, Bridget. My name is Rob, Hi. and I'm calling from Pilsen. Oh, great. Good. Go ahead with your I have question. A question. Thank you. I have a question about the advance or the child tax credit payment. Yeah. And I'm just wondering, is that something that I should 
take? And would that affect my income? Would that raise my income levels? And okay. could you tell me any advice and um, what that's all about? Okay, great. Thanks, Rob. So there's a new, because of, with the um, latest Recovery Act, they enhanced the child tax credit. So uh, people that earn uh, married couples, I'm going to speak in terms of married couples, uh, that earn uh, under $400,000 a year can get a $2,000 child tax credit. Uh, and I believe that it's for each child. Uh, and it's up to two child, I, I believe. Um, okay, so what they did with the uh, new Recovery Act was say, starting in, on July 15th, we're going to give you up more credit and we're going to advance that credit to you. Uh, the thing is that if you don't qualify for that part of the credit, that second part, we're going to take it back. So that means your taxes would be higher come April 15th. So the people, if you're married and you make over $150,000 a year, then you start getting phased out of this credit. And if you make $170,000 a year, you don't get it. And you, if you if they have been sending you the money, you have to give it back when you pay your taxes. So it's a, if your income has, they, they're sending out the payments based on your 2020 tax return. So if your income, if you're in that range, or probably about half that if you're single and are uh, head of household, I would be checking it if I was making around uh, over 75,000, but maybe 100,000. I'd be checking exactly what is that number. And uh, you, if your income has gone up, so if you've gone from making uh, 145 to 175, then I would um, think about either turning it off or just not even spending the money, putting it in my back pocket and sending it back uh, when they ask for it, when you do your taxes. And I think we've got another caller. Well, go ahead, caller. I'd like your first name and your neighborhood. So this is Kurt from Portage Park. Kurt, go ahead. Uh, you were mentioning the I bonds. Uh huh. And um, so you mentioned a ten thousand dollars limit. Is yeah. that per person, or if you're a couple, could you each put in ten thousand? Yeah, if you're a couple, you can each put in ten thousand. You want to be careful so that, uh, and you can look on the uh, U.S. Treasury Direct site for a little bit more information. But I, I would be try to be careful that you just have one person's social security number on it, like. For each login, uh, I'm not positive that that's uh, required, but you need to have a login, and then you put a social security number in for what I bond, uh, for to, so they can keep track of the ten thousand dollars. So um, that's that's uh, that's what it is, and it's uh, by individual. All right, okay, so let's go oh. ahead. Go ahead. And what uh, what's the difference between an I bond and the um, um, savings bond? The old well, savings yeah, the, uh, they're similar to old savings bonds. So um, my understanding is that with old savings bonds, they used to have paper, okay? And they, you would get issued these paper savings bonds. And the I bonds, you have to use through the internet. It's like, so you have to use the internet to get them. And they're not, they don't issue uh, you paper. And my understanding is now they have I bonds. And again, that's for inflation. And they have another one uh, called EE bonds, which I, you put the money in and then you don't get it for 20 years. And because of the, I, I'm more interested in the inflation protection elements of it. And most people I find, don't want to lock up everything for 20 years, and um, I don't find the EE bonds as attractive as uh, the I bonds. But um, they are what ha what replaced. Again, my understanding is they replaced the old savings bonds. Oh, okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah, and check again. You want to check U.S. Treasury Direct because that's how you can get them. The you can't. Yeah, you can't buy them through Schwab or like so a regular uh, a, reg a regular uh, U.S. Treasury 
bond you can buy through something like Schwab, but an I bond you can only get through US Treasury Direct. Okay, uh, so let's move on to Social Security. This is one of the questions that I got. Uh, for Terry, uh, here's a question. I'm 62, so-so health, and would like to stop working. I know I'll get more money if I wait, but I could eke by. Should I quit and take Social Security? Okay, so this is an awesome question. Um, when you're approaching Social Security, you, once you start at 62, if you don't have other, a job, you can uh, start taking Social Security. Uh, and that is pretty well before your full retirement age, which is right now, uh, if you're turning this age right now, is around 66 or 67. And so if you take it at 62, for each year that you go down, the amount that you get is reduced by 8%. And so the um, amount that you're going to get at 62 is greatly reduced. Now, you could pause it and then go back on it if you, like, I can't handle this, I'm going to go get a job, or uh, maybe you get uh, some other source of income and uh, you want to stop it again, and then it starts uh, growing again. So it's not, uh, and when you're in, those in that age, it's not a final decision. You can always, you can uh, turn it off even if you've turned it on. The other thing is, but if you start making money, then how much you can take in Social Security uh, and not be, is diminished. Um, the, it, once you're 66, if you wait until you're 70, uh, there's a big advantage because, again, then your, uh, it go, your income, how much you get from it goes up 8% a year. So I love it when people who are healthy uh, figure out a way to wait until they're 70 to take it. But it's got to be healthy. The break, there's a break-even age, like at what, how long do I have to live for this to pay off right? And you can look up on the internet and look up uh, break-even age calculators. But um, what I found in general uh, is that the break-even age to take it when you're 70 is about age 82. Now, that can vary by a year or two. It just depends on your situation. Um, it, it, can been, it can vary probably quite a bit on your situation. But if you think you're going to live until you're 82, uh, it's a good idea. The research shows that people underestimate how long they're going to live. And it can be by as much as five years. So you might think my health is so-so, um, but you might have five more years to live and eking it out. So it's hard for me to uh, recommend as much that you uh, go ahead and take it, although with those caveats. Um, very good. Uh, what about buying a two-flat? Um, for these are for people from across the country. A two flat's a common uh, building in Chicago. It's got two floors and each one has an apartment. You live on one floor and rent the other out. Do you recommend them? I recommend them for you need to make sure they're going to make money. Uh, so you want to make sure that the cash flow is good. So you have to figure out some numbers when you're like, can I get this much for rent? Uh, and you should know the neighborhood that you're buying in. Um, and then the other thing I have found in my experience is that people who are handy or, you know, like good with fixing things or are happy to learn that stuff uh, and don't mind that kind of extra little part-time job, it can be fulfilling for them if they like to be uh, related to their neighbors. So if they don't want to talk to their neighbors, not as good. All right. So. So with that, we're going to wrap it up. Thanks for tuning in to the Chicago Money Show. My name is Bridget Sullivan Rommel. I own a fee-only financial planning firm in Chicago. If you've got questions on this episode or for future episodes, please email us. You can email ask at chicagomoneyshow.com. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you in October.